Okay. Uh, so, praxeology or economics of a particular school of thought. This should, at least some of the terminology and some of the ways that this was uh, being discussed, should strike you all as relatively familiar from a lot of the terms and a lot of the ways of thinking that we've been going through so far in the context of McInerney, in the context of, uh, of uh, human action and that sort of thing. Because what this, this school of thought does, this is broadly speaking what's called the Austrian School of Economics, um, it's one of the, uh, what's referred to as the neo, one of the neoclassical schools of, eco of economics. Um, what it does is it takes these basic, um, these basic discoveries that we can make about how it is that human beings make choices and apply that on, a, uh, on an aggregate or a macro scale. To try and figure out not just how, how does this or that person make this or that choice under these or those circumstances, but rather how it is that people as a whole make choices and why do we choose um, why do we choose certain things rather than others and what trends does that give rise to in terms of our interactions with each other at a social level. So that is a short basic summary of the kind of thinking that we're trying to employ here and why I bring this up now and why I bring this up uh, in this class at all is because now hopefully we've got a pretty solid idea of the kind of ethical thinking that we've been going through, that we've been talking about throughout the semester, um, thinking about things in terms of selecting the correct ends and selecting means appropriate to those ends. And those means and ends being appropriate to the kinds of things and the kinds of people that we are in the circumstances that we might find ourselves in, uh, in the context of uh, our particular society or our particular, uh, our particular needs, et cetera. What this is doing is applying some of those same principles in a slightly different direction, but still having fundamentally to do with human action and what can we learn from that. All right, so with all that in mind, what did we, what did we think? Any general thoughts about, um, about what the article has to say, um, about this general view of matters? Or was there anything I, I ought to uh, try and clear up? What'd you think? Yes? What is praxeology? Uh, it means the study of human action. So, ology is the, uh, the Greek suffix, or yeah, the Greek suffix for study or the study of. <coughs> uh, from the root logos, logic. Um, so, this is the same. Uh, the same suffix you'll find in things like biology. Biology being the study of life, bios, life. Praxis is uh, the Greek root word for, uh, for pract uh, practical action or practice. Right? All these come from the same root word. So praxeology is the study of action as such. What is, uh, what does it mean, what does it mean to act? What does it mean to choose what to do? And so this is what we think of as a, a, a discipline within economics because what economics is, is not about money and exchanges of money per se. Economics is about uh, human action and interaction, particularly with respect to exchange. I have something and I want something else. How do I achieve that other thing? That's economics. Not even just trading resources, but also developing resources, right? Economics is also uh, beyond just you have something and I want it. How do I how do I convince you to let me have it? But it also might be I have certain things and I want other things. Can I use the resources I have available to me to acquire those other things? Right? I have an end in mind, something I'm striving towards, and I have a bunch of stuff at my disposal. Can any of that stuff produce the thing that I want? If not, does anybody else who has the thing that I want want any of the things that I have? If so, well then yes, my resources can obtain that thing that I want by giving them to somebody else in exchange for what I want. So that's how we get exchange, right? Exchange of resources and things like that is further down the line of analysis in economics. Economics starts with ends means reasoning. 
that can be uh, within one's own property, broadly speaking, what one has and what one can do. Um, or it can involve exchange and interaction between people. Now that's usually what we mean, is, is exchange between different people. Right? That's usually what we're talking about when we're talking about economics. But we have to start at the very beginning of, I want something, how do I acquire it? Right? I have a particular end in mind, and I have to find and select means to acquire it. And that's what he's talking about um, when he talks about technology. Right? That's what he means in terms of, uh, in terms of the means we employ to achieve an end. Anything like that would be called a technology in, in these terms. Now, note, technology has the same, again, root word as techne, which is the same root word as art or craft. Now, if you remember, that is, one, that is the virtue parallel to prudence. Right? So we were talking about the different, uh, the different virtues. Prudence or practical wisdom is applying reason to uh, to achieve ends by the right means, so choosing the right means to, to, to achieve an end. Art is choosing the right means to create something, to make something. These are very closely related concepts, and we see that close relationship here. So again, all of this, uh, at least a lot of this, in, at least in the terms that, uh, that Rothbard in particular uses, a lot of this follows very closely from the uh, from the structure of human action that we've been examining, broadly speaking, from Thomas Aquinas and from Aristotle. Did that answer the question? Okay. What else? Any other general thoughts or general questions about anything here? Questions about terminology as well. That's a perfectly good question. Ecology, ecology, something like that. Oh gosh, um, not exactly sure. Do you either remember where or what context, and I might be able to figure it out. Okay, one of the block quotes, maybe. Cogency, that's what I mean. Cogency, okay. Cogency refers to uh, internal consistency. Basically, that something makes sense. Something is cogent if it is understandable. Um, I, there might be a technical use of it. I'm trying to remember who he was quoting and why. And there might be a technical use of it in the discipline of economics that might not be something we necessarily need to worry about. Because there's some of that stuff too. Like he talks about a few things that are just technical terms in economics, like <clears throat> uh, like when he talks about elasticity of demand. Like, does anyone know what elasticity of demand means? Okay, so you do. If you haven't studied economics, like beyond, uh, beyond really basic intro, you probably don't know what that means. But when he mentions it, he just mentions it and says, yeah, but let's not worry about that, and moves on. Because that's, uh, that's, that's, something, that's a concept that's deeper into the analysis, and we have to figure out all of this basic stuff first. How do humans act? How do we make choices? What do our choices mean? Um, and so I believe when he's talking about cogency, he's talking about the kind of internal consistency of an idea or of a theory. That something is, uh, that something hangs together properly. That there aren't um, contradictions within it. So I think that's what he's talking about. I'm trying to find it exactly. Any other general thoughts about this, or you want to just start going through it? Okay. So I want to, broadly speaking, just sort of go through this and see if we can see if we can draw some connections to what we've been discussing, and then see if we can start gathering an idea of <clears throat> of what we're doing here by by sort of applying the the ideas that we've been working on and been developing to a broader and a different field of study, a different uh, a different application of the same ideas. So, looking at this, this sort of first section here, he's talking about what are the means of study of economics? What means are appropriate to study this particular discipline? Now think back to when we were talking about logic. 
When we were talking about logic and critical thinking, we were talking about appropriate versus inappropriate kinds of arguments. Right? This is a while ago. But there are certain arguments and certain ways of analysis and modes of understanding which are appropriate to certain disciplines and certain means that are not appropriate to those disciplines. Approaching certain questions using the wrong sort of analytic toolkit is not going to get you cogent answers, to use that term. And so he's arguing here in this first section that the appropriate way to study economics, that is the science of exchange, is through praxeology, this, through studying human action, human choices, and means ends reasoning. That we shouldn't be doing things like assuming that people are, uh, are going to necessarily pursue their own interests in the most efficient way possible, which is what some other schools of economics do. And that's why a lot of people have uh, take issue with economic science, especially econometrics, that is the measured and mathematical study of economies. That's why a lot of people take, take issue with this, because in general, people don't do that. People don't necessarily pursue their own interests by the most efficient means possible all of the time. That's not how human beings work. Now, maybe you can argue that it kind of works out that way in the large scale, in the aggregate, because in general, most people will probably be doing something like that, and the people who aren't are outweighed by the people who are. OK, but that's going to introduce errors into your reasoning. And part of his point here is, why should we introduce errors to our reasoning when we can think things through in a way that's infallible? We have access to infallible means of understanding this, this, this area of thought. Why not just employ those? And so what he takes to be the infallible means of understanding things like economics is the science of human action, praxeology, <clears throat> studying how it is that we make choices. OK. So we start off with what he calls the action axiom. And he gets this from another economist, Ludwig von Mises, which is that individuals act. So any given individual is going to act. What that means is that we are going to pursue some ends. We are going to act for a particular purpose. We're trying to do something. And in order to do that, because we are finite, we have to employ some means of acquiring or achieving that end. And so what we do is we select a means that we think is appropriate to that end. Now appropriate here means a couple of things. That it is capable of achieving that end and that that means is something that we have available to us. That's all it necessarily means. Now, having studied ethics, we can go beyond that. We can look and see, is this the right end? Is this end actually worth pursuing? Is this actually conducive to our happiness and our flourishing? We can also ask, is this means of achieving that end, is that correct? Is that just? Is it appropriate to the end insofar as it doesn't uh, either contradict that end or contradict some other primary end that we might have? Right? All things like that. In other words, we can criticize ends, and we can criticize means. But it's important to note that here, what we're doing here in economics, what he's doing here in economics, I suppose, because we're doing ethics, what he's doing here in economics is just the first step, looking at what is someone pursuing, how are they choosing to pursue it. And it's necessarily the case that whenever we do anything, we're doing something. That should seem obvious because it's supposed to be obvious. And by doing something, what I mean is that we are pursuing some end. And in order to pursue some end, we're employing some means that we have available to us. OK. With me so far? Simple enough. Right. Pretty indisputable. Now, he goes through later on a kind of defense of this axiom. Um, he goes to argue that, no, this really is self-evident. In other words, you cannot reasonably deny that we act for certain ends. Again, this should be obvious, and we've kind of gone over it a little bit. right? McInerney makes this argument that we are always necessarily doing this. And so even to try and deny it, we're just employing the process in order to deny it. Rothbard makes a similar point through, I believe it was Hayek when he, he quotes. He quotes a couple of people on this note. But he points out that if you are going to try and argue that we do not act for certain ends, 
Well, what you are, or you're not, maybe we don't necessarily employ means available to us to achieve certain ends. Maybe we're just doing things arbitrarily and for no particular reason. Well, what you are doing in trying to prove that is you are pursuing some end by the means available to you. You're pursuing the end of disproving some axiom with the means available to you, that is rhetoric, language, communication. You're proving yourself wrong by trying to prove yourself right. This is how axioms work. Axioms are self-evident because they are, uh, the opposite is what we call self-referentially incoherent. It doesn't make sense to argue to the contrary. It's like arguing, if I were to argue, I don't exist. Do we see why there's a problem with me arguing that I don't exist? What's the issue there? Yes, ex ex elaborate slightly, because you're right, but explain why that's self-contradictory. All right, well, it's contradicting because if it didn't exist, we wouldn't even be discussing. We wouldn't even be talking to you about anything because you would not even be a cell of this universe that exists. Right, right, because if I am going to argue that I don't exist, who's arguing it? You. The one who allegedly doesn't exist. Turns out I'm wrong. Right. Necessarily, I have to be in a case like that. Right? So this is how the action axiom is supposed to work. This is also how a few other connected axioms work as well. So he goes through, first of all, the action axiom, and then the, the, the employment of means to achieve ends. This he takes to be axiomatic as well because he points out that the means we have available to us are finite. That is, we have to expend something to achieve something. This is also impossible to argue against because if you're going to argue against it, you're expending some resource, that is time at least, in order to achieve some end. It's impossible to argue against this conclusion without expending some kind of a resource in order to do so. And so what this tells us is the principle of what's called scarcity. Scarcity means that among the things that we value, some, at least, of those things are things that are not super abundant. In economic terms, demand exceeds supply at price zero. Yes? Um, I'm an economics major. Oh, help me out here, definition for economics, it's like the study of human decision making in the face of scarcity. There you go. So I like the this about scarcity. Yeah, that's right. That's also another point. Um, and he makes this point. Economic reasoning, even ends means reasoning, does not apply with respect to non-scarce goods. So again, non-scarce goods means that there is more available than you want, than anyone wants. Let's put it that way. Air is the example that he uses. Under most human circumstances, breathable air is super abundant. It is non-scarce. And so we don't employ ends means reasoning to breathe. But you might under some circumstances, right? If you're in space, for example, then you definitely need to economize your intake of air. What that means is that there's only a certain amount available, there's a certain amount that you need, there's a certain amount that you want for various purposes, right? And this is why, for example, um, well, one reason, for example, why spaceships are small. Like, real-life spacecraft are quite small. The reason for that is because air is a commodity. Under that context, because it's scarce, there is less of it available than we want to be available in space. And so if we had as much air as we possibly could want, and if we could just take it up there, no problems would occur indefinitely, and, we, could, and we didn't have to worry about processing it through, you know, whatever. Like, whatever kind of atmosphere processors we want to use, whether that's plants, whether that's machinery, a second. Then we wouldn't have to worry about economizing space, like space available, atmosphere available. Isn't there no oxygen whatsoever in space? Right. Except what we take up there. Like, manned spacecraft have breathable air in them because we take it there. It's not available there, 
by default. It's scarce under those different circumstances. Right? I make this point to show, um, if, if nothing else, that scarcity is not based on the kind of thing that we're talking about necessarily. It's based entirely upon the, the circumstances. Because something would be considered non-scarce or superabundant if there's more of it than everyone who wants it could want. Again, at price zero. If it costs nothing to attain it, if it costs nothing to obtain as much of it as you want, it's considered non-scarce. Yeah, but sunlight during the day, right? So, silly outlandish example. Suppose you're hunting vampires. It's a common occurrence, right? Um, suppose you're hunting vampires. <clears throat> do you do so at, during the day or do you do so at night? Well, you'd like to do so during the day, but they're not there, right? The reason they're not there is because, well, there's this super abundant resource, sunlight, that tends to make your job of hunting vampires much easier. At night, sunlight is difficult to come by. I mean, maybe, I mean, it depends on the, depends on the specific mythology of vampires here. It could, it could perfectly well be that strong enough ultraviolet light or full spectrum light or something counts, counts as sunlight. And you can, in fact, take it with you and produce something like sunlight at night. But then you're producing it. You're having to expend resources all of a sudden. Like you need a really powerful battery and a really powerful lamp to emit this equivalent to sunlight, which is great. But that's a cost, right? You're having to employ some means to achieve some end rather than just, well, the sun and it is light. The energy from the battery will run out of it. Exactly. Yeah. There's a reason you don't have, if you have a flashlight, say, and if you need to use it for something, there's a reason you don't just leave it on all the time. <laughs> By contrast, this, this, is a, this is a real life example. This is to my life where, uh, where things that are technically scarce can be under certain circumstances treated as if they were super abundant because of the precise circumstances involved. So um, I used to live in a condo and part of the condo fee covered utilities. But it didn't cover utilities like up to a certain limit, or it didn't cover utilities plus a certain amount for like overcharges or anything. No, it just covered um, a few utilities like water, uh, water, sewage, trash, and a couple of other things. So I have I have two cats, who like most cats prefer to drink running water rather than still water. And so because water was for me, super abundant. I could acquire as much water as I reasonably wanted at price at cost zero. I left the faucet running most of the time because the cats liked to drink from it. Now I'm sure if I were like, if I were to do that and pay my own water bill, let's just say I was getting my money's worth from the condo fee. Yes, it would. Now that's, that's not an expense that I would ordinarily go to. And I know this because I don't, right? I have a particular need for water. And I have certain means that I can employ to acquire it. Mostly money, right? Because we live in a mostly exchange capitalistic economy, roughly speaking, right? I can acquire water through the use of money to the water company. Right. Okay. If I did not need to employ that means, if the only means that I needed to employ to acquire water was turn on the faucet, that's a significantly lower uh, expenditure of resources on my part. And in fact, turning off the water is an expenditure of resources. I have to go and turn it off, <clears throat> which is why if the cats asked for water, I would just turn it on and then leave it until I went back to the bathroom to turn it off. if I turned it off. Sometimes I would. I wouldn't leave it on when we left the house, because that's actually quite dangerous. You shouldn't do that. But, um, but throughout most of the day, some of the times, if the cats wanted water, leave the water running. 
Now, the reason I won't do that now is because I have particular desires and needs for water. I use water, like, like most of us do. But this is actually a point that he makes. Uh, he makes later on in this article um, the point of diminishing, uh, diminishing marginal utility. Again, people who have studied economics, they said this should sound vaguely familiar. The first unit of some good that you want or you pursue has a certain value to you. In other words, you'll expend a lot of resources to acquire it. But the next unit of that same good, you will expend less. And then the next unit, you will necessarily expend less. Then the next unit of that good, you'll necessarily expend, yeah, expend less. This is because you will necessarily prioritize given the limited means that you have, you will necessarily prioritize pursuing the things that you want the most, that you most need, most desire, the most important ends to you. So this is why, for example, if water suddenly got very, very expensive, you would use less. But there are certain things you would still do with water. You might not wash your car as often, but you would probably still drink water. You, you might, um, say, take shorter showers, but you would probably still bathe yourself. What that tells me is that you, you value certain uses of a certain good higher than other uses of that good. Another thought experiment here. Suppose you want to buy a house. Big expensive purchase, it's a big deal, okay. You're considering buying this house. Um, you're about to do so, you've already decided that yes, th buying this house is, a, is an appropriate expenditure of however much it costs. And then you find that suddenly the seller has decided that they're going to cut the price in half and then also sell the house next door for that same half price. Would you buy one or would you buy both? One. Why only one? Well, there is. There's just not as much of a reason for a second house. But it's more practical to have one house. Not necessarily. If you've already committed to expending, say, $200,000, let's say, and the seller decides that instead of selling you this house for $200,000, they're going to sell it to you for $100,000 and then still also offer you the house next door for another $100,000. Well, you already said, I'm willing to expend $200,000 on a house. So why would you not just expend that same $200,000 on two houses? Well, so you have to worry about both houses instead of one. Yeah, yeah. So you have to worry for, let's say, security for one house. You have to worry about the other one. And okay. Other things. Well. Let's change the scenario. Suppose instead of the house is half price, suppose that the seller offers the house buy one, get one free. If you buy this house, you get the next door one. You missed the first half of this thought experiment, I apologize. There's a good reason to look confused at this stage. Suppose the, the seller said, all right, if you buy this house for $200,000, I'll throw in the house next to it for free. Would you say no thank you? Yeah, right, say, hey, thanks, cool, free house. But it's not free, it costs you exactly the same as the previous scenario. Okay, here's the difference. One house is worth to you at least $200,000. A second house is worth less than $100,000 to you. I know this because you just told me you would not buy a second house for $100,000 even if you had it freely available, the $100,000. Even if you had those means available, you wouldn't spend it on a house. You told me this. That's how much of a difference first, first unit of a good versus second unit of a good can be. And it's because of different utility, right? You can only use so much of something. Having one house, very useful. Having two houses, a lot less useful a lot less useful. <laughs> yeah.
You ever, um, you ever go to the grocery store and you get disappointed by a buy one, get one free sale instead of just a discount? Because, damn it, there's no room in my freezer for another gallon of ice cream. Or something. Maybe not ice cream, maybe not that exactly, but, <clears throat> but yes, you're getting more for the same amount when it would be just preferable not to because you don't have a particular need. You don't have as much particular need of the second thing. Maybe you'll take it anyway just because I suppose I'll just eat this gallon of ice cream before it melts. Maybe not that great of an idea, but hey, have a great afternoon and regret it later. Either way, either way, the point here is that we can, we can look at these kinds of choices that we all will make, and these are, these are very predictable kinds of choices, although we might vary from person to person. And we can show that our preferences are, or our ends, the ends that we pursue, or the ends that we desire, are ordered in some way. We prefer certain things more than others, so we're more willing to expend what resources we have for them. Now, there are some people who, when offered a second house for half price as well, would probably say, yes, I would like that second house. But most people probably wouldn't. Now, why I say most people wouldn't and not just, no, certainly not, is because people's valuation of certain goods is wildly distinct. People are individuals. I have certain... Um, I have certain ends that I want to pursue, and I'm willing to use certain means for those ends. And my willingness to use my means to achieve my ends is radically different from your willingness to use your means to achieve your ends. And this is also why he points out that econometrics, sort of mathematical economics, has problems. Because people aren't interchangeable. People are not economic units. People are people. With, with particular wants, desires, choices, means available to them, etc. And so we can't, we necessarily can't make definitive predictions about what people will choose under particular circumstances unless we know something about that person's means available to them and their particular ends and the ordering of their ends that might, they might not even be consciously aware of. You were probably not consciously aware of the amount that you would, under this weird hypothetical, spend on a house. But we can figure it out. Again, just through talking things through and considering hypotheticals. That might have its own problems, but we can set that aside. Like the, the use of hypotheticals in this kind of, this kind of analysis. Mainly because there's a big difference between saying, yeah, hypothetically, I would spend, this, spend these resources on this end, and then actually doing so. Actually doing so, sometimes you'll do more, sometimes you'll do less. It might, it might actually differ. Questions on any of this? Pretty good so far. Clear as to what we're getting at. OK. Moving forward a little bit, moving on. He points out that all action takes place temporally, in time. From, it takes a duration, and all choices now are aiming towards events in the future. This is necessarily the case simply because of how we experience the flow of time and how we exist within the sort of flow of time. And this, this tells us certain things, that we are willing to make um, we're willing to incur costs now for some benefit in the future. But that that also might differ. I might be willing to incur a certain expense for something in the future, but I might be less willing to incur that expense for something further into the future. And by less willing, I mean I'm definitely less willing to incur the same expense for something further in the future. This is what's called time preference. You have a preference to have things sooner rather than later, I guarantee it. If, so for example, if given the choice between being able to have some non-perishable good now versus tomorrow, the only reason you would choose tomorrow over today is if it were cheaper. 
Because if you can have it today, that means you'll still have it tomorrow. You can just choose to use it tomorrow. Having it now is, simply speaking, better in basically every way. And so our willingness to exchange time for goods varies from person to person. I might be significantly willing to, to, um, to pay a lot more for something way down the line than somebody else might because the, the present, present acquisition of an end is more valuable than its long-term acquisition. And again, this is something that differs from person to person, but there is necessarily some kind of a time preference in, uh, in the choices that we make. Right? I will expend these resources now for something in the future. How far in the future will determine how much of my resources and what resources I'm willing to expend for it. Now this also means that our expenditure of resources and our use of means to achieve ends is limited by our awareness of the efficiency of our means. Right? If we want to achieve some end, and we choose, to, we choose to employ some means to achieve that end, what that means is we think that it's going to work. But we might, we might not be fully correct about that. Right? You can make mistakes in prudence, basically. You can have a deficiency of prudence. You can choose some means to achieve some end and then fail to attain it. That can happen. It, in fact, happens all of the time with most of us. Yeah. Yeah. You might again. You might have. I mean, I uh, I like a lot of people. I really like those like Restaurant Impossible kind of shows. I like the where where the angry British chef. There's a few different ones comes in and and tries to fix your utterly failing business. And usually, he's capable of doing so with the resources available there. It's just that the owners are horribly misusing those resources. right? So you might think that this massively, uh, this massively diverse, eclectic menu that has all sorts of chef specials for, uh, for each day of the week that a bunch of people want differently is going to be massively successful. But then angry British chef comes in here and says, no, that's ridiculous. Simplify your menu. People don't want that kind of variety in a restaurant. They want a reliable restaurant. Oh, hey, look, that means is a more efficient and effective way of achieving the end that I want, which is a successful business, et cetera. Right? Serving other people's needs in exchange for them patronizing my restaurant. So you might perfectly well be wrong about how to pursue some end. It might even turn out that you're, you're pursuing the wrong end. You're pursuing an end that is ultimately not satisfying uh, your, your desires, not satisfying your ultimate flourishing, or anything like that. You might pursue some end, achieve it, and then realize, oops, I shouldn't have done that. Debatable. It's a good end not paying taxes. It's just the means of doing so are difficult to obtain. Let's put it that way. <clears throat> it's, very, it's very difficult to effectively not pay taxes. Um, something worth noting that isn't really elaborated upon now that you bring up, bring up that point. Something that is, uh, that is brought up here, that, that isn't brought up in this article, <clears throat> that has a, an odd place within economic science, is the use of force. So taxation being an example of this. The means employed to achieve some end are usually usually what is considered under this, under, under, uh, under the discipline of economics, separate from the discipline of political economy or politics, is what means do I possess within my own property to achieve some end? Usually this only considers voluntary use of one's resources and voluntary exchange with others. We have to add to this picture involuntary interactions and look to what those interactions will do to the choices that we might make. 
So taxes are a great example of this. So a tax on a certain good, what is that going to do to, how do we describe that, one, in ethical terms, in terms of like who is doing what, and what is our end, and what is our means of achieving that end? And then also, how is that going to affect the actions of the people involved in the taxed exchange? So first of all, this is why a, at least some kind of an understanding of economy is pretty important to understanding or trying to do anything like social theory. Because you kind of need to know how it is that, that people will interact and people will make choices. So consider the case of a tax on a particular good. Milk, sure, let's go with that. There's a milk tax. Who is doing what in terms of enacting a tax? What is the end? What are they trying to achieve? So what's their remote end? What action are they using to achieve that end? So what is their action? And then also, how is that going to alter or affect the choices being made by the people who are, who are exchanging things now under this tax? So people who buy and people who sell milk or people who trade for milk or whatever? So people who trade milk yeah, be taxed higher than normal. Mm -hmm. And then I would make the price of milk skyrocket for people to buy it. What does that mean? So that means that instead so, of the regular price you have now. Hold on, hold on. Let me, let me reframe my question. What does it mean to say that a price increases? in these terms, in terms of action, in terms of means and ends. Sure, that's, a, that's, that's our conclusion, but you're jumping ahead. You know this because you've studied a bit of this. And I mean, it's pretty intuitive to be fair. But, but why, why is that? Because we can figure out why. We have all of the tools now available to us to figure out why that's the case. Well, I don't know, something like milk, people still drink milk. It's like, that would be more inelastic. Like, you can't really, there's not many substitutes for milk. That's why, like, there's not. Well, nowadays there are. But yeah. There's some. That also depends, though. As an ingredient, it's pretty, it's pretty necessary for a lot of things. But, now it's, again, my water example really shows this. Every good, every, demand for absolutely every good is elastic on the margin. But that's, that's jumping too far ahead here. What does it mean to say that the price increases in terms of who is acting and what are they pursuing and what means are they pursuing it with? It's a hard question. But like I said, though, we have all the tools we need. OK. Someone is pursuing milk. I want milk. I have money for that milk. Great. I'm willing to exchange this amount of money for this amount of milk. Somebody else wants my money more than they want their milk. They're willing to exchange their, the milk that they have from their cow or their supplier or whatever for my money. Great. We can make a deal here. Because I want the milk more, they want the money more. When we exchange, we're both getting something we want and employing a means to achieve it. They are employing the means of giving me a gallon of milk in order to acquire the money that I have. I am using the means I have available to me, cash in hand, to acquire a gallon of milk. <clears throat> okay, that is stable throughout this exchange. There is an additional end that both the seller and the buyer need to pursue in the case of a taxed exchange. This is what we call compliance cost. Well, economists call it a compliance cost. 
not an economist. I study economics sometimes. What this means is essentially that the buyer and the seller, in addition to wanting money and wanting milk, want to avoid the violence threatened upon them by the tax man, so to speak. Right? That's why we pay taxes. From a praxeological standpoint, the reason we pay taxes is because bad things will be done to us if we don't. That isn't to say that, that taxes are extracted for the purpose of not doing bad things to people. That's not what it means. There might be a reason to, to extract taxes that are for what the taxes are going to be paying for. That's a separate concern for a different person who is acting in, involved in this exchange but acting separately. In terms of the taxed exchange, though, I want milk and, so I want milk, I also want to not be audited. I'm willing to exchange money for one thing, and I'm willing to exchange money for the other thing. Now, that is going to impose an additional cost on me, and that means that I'm having to use some of the means I have available to me, money primarily, for avoiding punishment due to avoidance of taxes or something like that. To avoid the, to avoid the violence threatened. Right? I'm using some of my resources to avoid that. Now that's a pretty high priority. It's a fairly high priority for most people to avoid government force being employed against them. And so people are relatively willing to expend some of their resources to do that. And so that's a pretty high, high on their list of, of means being expended. Okay, But that means if they, if they are using some of their resources to, uh, to pay these taxes, say, that means that now we have the diminishing returns problem kicking in. And so a particular unit of milk, as such, might be, might be worth less to them, so to speak. They might be willing to expend fewer of their resources to get a gallon of milk because they have fewer resources available after taxes. And because they're willing to expend fewer resources after, uh, after taxes, what that means is they're not willing to expend the same amount for a gallon of milk plus taxes as they would have. It, so here, let me draw something. This is easier to visualize if I'm not just waving my hands around. Cost of milk. Sure. Numbers don't matter. Remember, that's, that's, a, whole, that's a whole point that he makes. Numbers don't matter. Taxes. All right. Now, here's the problem. Given that I'm paying this much for taxes, I might not be any longer willing to pay this much for milk. And so what this means is that my willingness to spend money on milk plus taxes is not this much. It might be that much. Right? And so what, hap what has to happen is the cost of milk by necessity has to go down for me to buy it. If the taxes are going to remain, say, well, whatever it is, the same amount. Right? Because now I'm willing to spend, no, this doesn't match up right. I'm willing to spend maybe a little bit more than I would have for just a gallon of milk to have that gallon of milk and not have the tax man come to my door. <clears throat> but I'm not willing to expend the same amount for that gallon of milk because the avoidance of that violence is a much higher priority. And so I'm using, I'm trying to use less of my resources. I'm willing to use less of my resources for that gallon of milk than I otherwise would have been. And so this is how and this is why the cost of taxes is shared between the seller and the buyer. Sales tax doesn't just get passed on to the consumer. We know this because of our comparative willingness to expend our resources on various goods, given costs, given additional costs imposed upon them, etc. So it's it the cost of this this tax burden is essentially paid by both the seller and the buyer, even though one is collecting it. So basically when you pay sales tax, for example, you're not sending a check to the government. 
the seller is. So like grocery stores pay taxes on the things that they sell. But you don't, technically. But because of that, th that because of that, um, because of that distinction, for example, suppose there were so there's like a six percent sales tax in Florida, seven in some places, it's eight in a couple places, but six percent sales tax in Florida. If that went away tomorrow entirely, I guarantee you the price of goods would not simply go down by six percent. The price of goods would probably go down by about I don't know, a random guess between three and five percent. Because people, because everyone already knows, everyone is willing to spend this amount of money. Yeah, you're willing to spend a little bit less, but now the prices, the prices of, there's this additional cost that no longer exists. So now we have slightly more resources available to us, and those slightly more resources available to us means that we are willing to pay a little bit more, but not the same amount more. So what this does essentially is by imposing this additional cost, right, imposing this additional. Um, this additional thing that you're willing to spend resources upon, it alters the other exchanges that are involved. And even, worth noting, a tax on milk will change your spending habits with respect to other things as well. You're probably more likely to buy relative substitutes for milk. You might still use milk for things that it's necessary for, say recipes, but you're probably more willing to drink other things with roughly equivalent nutritional value, say. If it means that you can uh, avoid the uh, avoid the threats imposed by the taxation without having to expend those resources to to um, to actually you know pay it, well you're you're going to do that, but you're going to do it by reordering your um, your particular desires and your particular wants. And again, all of this, all of these calculations, all of this figuring out what the effects of this will be, just come from figuring out how it is that people value things, what ends people pursue, how people will choose to pursue them, based upon what they have available to them and what they think they can achieve with those means. Make sense? Yeah. And this is also effectively why <clears throat> there's a reduced demand when there is an increased price. It's because you're willing to expend some amount of resources on unit one of something. Right? Your first gallon of milk, you'll probably spend more than you currently do. If prices went up, you'd still probably buy that first gallon or maybe that first half gallon. But you wouldn't buy a second one. You would if it were a lot cheaper. By the way, this is why buy one get one 50% off sales actually work a little bit. This is why people will buy things at half price for a second unit. Think about it this way as well. If I ask you, you know, how much is this product worth? say, a gallon of milk. How much is this worth to you? And you give me a price. That's how much you'd be willing to spend on it. That, that's not true, exactly. That's how much the first unit is worth to you. Because if it were just a good purchase, if it were necessarily a good trade to buy a gallon of milk for $5 every time, you would do nothing but buy milk with all of your resources, because it's a good deal. Well, no, it's not. That's ridiculous. And you recognize that that's ridiculous. Because one gallon of milk is worth this much to you, but two gallons of milk is worth a little bit more, but not double. All right. What else? Any, any questions on anything we've been either just talking about or something to elaborate on further or anything else in here to discuss? Or, well, yeah. For diminishing marginal utility by economics of the best suit. He like has have a stack of fruits crackers. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we eat the first one like, oh, that's pretty good. You know, and then the second one like, it's not as good. And then at the bottom, it's like, I need to sip a lot now. I do not want to 
he's cracked his zero. He's making zero happen. So he kind of criticizes that view. Rothbard does. I think maybe correctly. Because that makes certain additional assumptions about psychology, right? About things like um, like the what we would think of as in terms of diminishing returns of, say, pleasure in something. It, it's the addiction model, basically. <clears throat> Which is not necessarily the case with everything. Right? Why that applies economically is simply because um, we necessarily will employ our resources, our means, to our most valued ends first. It will be our highest priority. And so what that means is that you might just love Ritz crackers. You might just, like, unlike most of the class, you might just like down the whole stack, not a problem. Water, what's that? Uh, I, have, I have a copious amount of saliva because I'm just drooling over these Ritz crackers. I just want them all right now. Maybe. Maybe there's some weirdo like that. Who knows? But what that means is that even that person would still be willing to pay more for the first half of the package than the second half of the package. And it's not because the second half of the package is any worse for them. Maybe they're just still loving it all the way, just d delicious and wonderful. It's just, yeah, they have a, a particular need for delicious, wonderful Ritz crackers, but they also have other things that they might expend their resources on. And those other things sort of have to take some priority. Probably. I say probably because it's entirely possible for, say, I mentioned the addiction model, an addict to have their addictive substance as not just the highest priority, but the only priority. And so everything else kind of goes by the wayside. Of course, that's bad long-term thinking because if all of your resources are going to pursuing this particular end, heroin, say, a particular addictive substance. The reason heroin is so self-destructive, in addition to the health consequences, is because, uh, because the psychological effects reorder your, uh, your, your wants, your desires, so significantly. And so in the long term, why this is a problem is because, well, if you're expending all of your resources on heroin, you're not expending any resources on acquiring more resources. You're going to run out of heroin. You're going to run out of heroin. Wait, where are we going? Where right? OK, so suppose you're a heroin addict. Right? Maybe hard to imagine, but let's, let's suppose that, uh, suppose Carl is a heroin addict. Maybe that's easier. Carl, the heroin addict, wants a lot of heroin. That's about it. He's got a bunch of money. He spends it all on heroin. Spends all of his time doing heroin. Now Carl is out of money, and therefore, Carl is out of heroin and out of means to acquire it. He might, right, so he might still have some means to acquire it, but it's significantly less means and it's means that he would not have deferred to before. He's significantly more desperate for the acquisition of, of his drug, right? Okay, so what this tells us is that Carl is thinking entirely in terms, of, uh, in terms of as close to immediate solutions, or immediate ends, I should say, as possible. He wants heroin and he wants it now. He doesn't want heroin and wants it over the course of the next several years because that's how long he's going to be addicted, he thinks. Okay. I'll hit rock bottom in like five or six years. By then, then I'll get over it, right? I'll go to rehab and then that'll be fine. Right? And he's not planning that far ahead. He's planning for, I'm going to go get high tonight, and then he spends all of his money on heroin. Right. The problem with addiction is that it is a very bad long-term solution because it, it, it alters your time preference, at least with respect to one particular good, the one you're addicted to. Where was I going with this? Mm, okay. Yeah, it had to do with opportunity. Well, opportunity costs as well, right? But um, well, because again, means are finite and they can only be applied to certain ends, not to others, right? Um, and then also diminishing marginal utility, right? Um, 
the first unit of some good is is more uh, is worth more to us than the second. Right? And that, even that's true for Carl, poor heroin addict Carl. Right? The first shot of heroin is worth more to him than the second. But it just so happens that the hundredth shot of heroin is more, is worth more to him than his house. So here we go. Not anymore. <laughs> Use your imagination as to what happened to them. I don't know. He, he sold them. <laughs> I mean, when you get into um, what are technically called red market goods, selling your family for heroin is unfortunately an option. So not black market goods. Black market is, uh, is, oh god, okay, we have 10 minutes. Some technical terminology that's useful for this and also useful for ethics. So there's a distinction between illegal and criminal. Uh, illegal is, uh, is uh, prohibited. Criminal is, uh, is a, a direct assignable harm to person or property. Okay, there's a distinction there. And so because of that distinction, there are several sort of marketplaces. There is the white market. White market is the legal sale of legal non-criminal goods. Right? Okay, simple enough. So buying a cup of coffee. Okay. It's, not, it's not illegal. I'm doing it legally, and it is not criminal. It's not, uh, there's no direct assignable harm to personal property. Okay. The gray market is the illegal sale of legal goods. So underground black market coffee, what we would think of as black market coffee. Coffee's not illegal, but, but say, better example, um, not quite. That's next. So, so gray market would be something like if I were to be, uh, say, brewing beer and selling it without a license. That's gray market. It is the illegal sale of legal goods. The beer is not illegal, right? You can brew beer without a license. The problem is selling it to somebody else without a license. That's prohibited by law. So that would be gray market. It is the illegal sale of legal goods. Okay, the black market is the illegal sale of illegal goods. Um, no, no, data piracy is gray market. So, uh... That's still gray market. That's still gray market. Yeah. Yeah. Drugs are typically black market. Right. Illegal drugs are black market. Um, I mean, maybe it depends on what the movie is. But so sale of uh, sale of snuff films. That'd be black market. Again, not technically criminal in the fact in so far as it uh, the good in question is not criminal in the sense that it has no, uh, no particular and assignable harm to person or property. Okay. Same applies to drug trade, uh, same applies to any other black market, black market interaction or exchange. Um, that kind of thing. The pink market, there's, there's two more, there's pink market and red market. The pink market is the legal sale of criminal goods. This is rare, but it exists. Um, the sale of goods which is not prohibited by law, but which does have a direct assignable harm to person or property. Um, usually you find this in, say, corrupt regimes, where the goods in question are something like um, uh, often something like mercenary forces in, in an unjust war or an undeclared or illegal war or something like that. Um, it could be, say, um, bounty hunting for, for uh, unjust or, un, or, unjust or non-criminal laws or something like that. So it's, it's the legal sale of goods. It's not prohibited by law, but it's criminal interactions. It's things which, are, uh, which do have a direct assignable harm uh, to person or property that's 
again, technically not retributive and not, not, not preventative. Because again, not justified, say, by the, uh, the law of double effect or anything like that. Yeah? So, like, uh, good example of that, I think, would be during the uh, Civil War, and Gun companies would sell illegal copies of rifles, yeah. but it was illegal to sell them to the people in Rhodesia. Right. So it is. It would be more like. It would be more like if, if mercenaries, say from the U.S., were, there was no law preventing them from going to Rhodesia, and they happened to just bring their bring some rifles along with them and happened to be you know, participating in the conflict on one side or the other. Okay, it's, it's criminal action, but there's technically not a lot, not laws against it. Now there might be, there might be, some, there might be treason things if they were fighting on the wrong side, so to speak, or something, but, but assuming that they were, you know, unofficially helping, uh, say, uh, the US side or something, US invasion, something like that. That is criminal because it's not part of a declared war, but it's technically legal. There's no, there's no law prohibiting it. There might be international laws, but again, this pink markets depend on what jurisdiction you're talking about. A lot of that is fuzzy. Red markets, this is easy to figure out. This is the illegal sale of illegal and criminal goods. So contract killing. Um, that'd be black market. Uh, the exchange of organs, the, the sale of organs, not the exchange of organs, which is a weird, weird quirk, which we have three minutes. It's not enough time to talk about whether, whether organ sales are a good idea or not. Might make a good case study, though. <clears throat> Something to think about. Um, but I think that would be black market. Now, someone selling someone else's kidneys, that's red market. Because you're taking someone's kidneys. Why are there so many colors for the market? I mean, red shaded ones are criminal. White means just legal stuff. And then black and then not quite black is just gray. So th there's, there's five markets in this case. There are, uh, there are four odd ones, depending on whether something is illegal or criminal or both. That was more like a side note, but again, it looked, it, it, it relates to what we were kind of, it kind of relates, I guess, to what we're talking about in terms of, um, in terms of means that you're willing to use for some end, right? So if you're willing to, right, you may not be willing to go to a gray or black market for something, for some end that you are pursuing. And so what that means is that effectively, you do not have those means available to you because you, maybe rightly, consider it to be unethical. Right? So the ethical considerations that we've all been talking about, that ethics does, it acts as a kind of constraint upon economic interactions for people who accept and understand them because it limits means and it gives us certain ends that are worth pursuing and not worth pursuing. And so that's how these wind up interacting with each other. Economics allows us to understand how it is that we act and interact with each other. Ethics allows us to understand why people interact the ways that they do because we understand certain things about ethical interactions. And then also, it tells us what interactions and what actions we should be pursuing for our own, in our own case. So these tend to work together because they have so many similar assumptions. And they have the same sort of mechanics of action. It's just that one is, uh, one is about the, the sort of facts of the matter, and one is about the normative claims, right? what we ought to be doing, that sort of thing. 